Okay, we got a problem here. This is a pretty common one, but we can absolutely take care of this one pretty quickly. I just had a new student start in my online TIG welding program, and one of the first things I get them to do is send me a little bit of their work. But one of the first questions my student asked me was, why are my TIG welds not shiny? Asking him to send me a photo of his work, this is what he sent me here. Okay, cool, no problem. Let's put a little bit of context down on this one first. So this is a student named Mike. This dude is absolutely awesome. He had just bought a brand new TIG welding machine. He had no prior experience and this was his first two welds using it. Gotta say, didn't do too bad. Now, some of my favorite people to teach in my online program is people with zero experience, kind of a blank slate, easier to teach kind of thing. But whatever the experience level, let's go. So let's take a look at this photo again and really pick apart what we see here. We're gonna take a look at this one here first. What we can see here is something where he has tried to use filler material, but we can see it is not quite sitting down or blending into the base material as much as we would like it to. We can take a look at the puddle shape, see the puddle shape on these ones is a little bit weird. And what we can see is this scratchy or scraggly looking stuff around the edges like this here. Another thing that we notice is we do not see any cleaning action. Super weird, right? Okay, so let's take a look at the second one here. Now we can see a few things that actually look a little bit different about this one. I actually asked Mike, was this one here the one that you did first and then you did this one second? He said, yes. So on the second pass, take a look at these first few puddles here. We can take a look at the start right here and we can see that the things at the beginning are a little bit shinier and we can see the filler material is blending into the base material a little more effectively. However, take a look at what happens as Mike starts to advance across the pass. We can see the same problems with the finish as the first one start to creep up on this one as well. We actually start seeing a little bit of a change in the overall shape and profile of it. Everything starts to flare out and become a little bit excessive in width. So looking at this photo here was actually a great place for us to start with. Now, here are the things that I'm starting to see a little bit more as I look at this photo a little more in detail. The first thing that we can see looking at the first example is this scratchy looking stuff here. We can see this happens quite a bit at the start of the pass. Now, this is something that I talk about a lot on my show. What we're looking at here is called arc deflection. Essentially what is happening here is the arc is having problems establishing smoothly to the workpiece. This footage of what you're looking at right here is exactly what I'm talking about. You can see how the arc is having problems locking onto the target that we are aiming at. It's flickering all over the place. Except looking at the example that we were checking out here with Mike, what we see is actually a little bit different. Now, typically arc deflection looks like this example here. We can still see it looks a little bit scratchy and crazy, but what we're looking at here actually kind of looks a little bit clean, right? Now take a look at the other example of arc deflection here. Now, arc deflection can happen from a couple different causes. Back to this clip here. We can see that in this clip here, this tungsten is trashed. It's contaminated. It has a terrible preparation and finish to it. The arc is having all kinds of problems locking onto its target, especially at low amperage. So looking back at the photo from Mike here, what caused the arc deflection on this one? We can see that compared to the other example of arc deflection, the arc deflection in this photo here looks a little bit dirty and contaminated. It looks pretty different, right? Here's why. Now this is something that is very common for people who have a couple different issues going on here. Now one of these things that's very common is something that I refer to as an excessive standoff distance. This term refers to the distance from the tip of the tungsten to the workpiece. People also refer to this as arc length, arc distance, whatever you want to call it, you get the idea. But take a look at this example here again. Notice how the arc deflection is only happening on one side of the pass. Really fishy, right? Now when we see arc deflection looking a little bit contaminated or dirty, this is typically almost always caused by an excessive standoff distance. Simply because things are a little further away, the arc is having problems establishing and locking onto its target. And we can also see that as arc deflection happens, the gas quality is going to diminish a little bit, causing contamination. Now, notice how the arc deflection is only occurring on the one side of this pass. Not only are we dealing with a standoff distance that is a little bit excessive here, but we are also dealing with incorrect torch angles as well. As I mentioned, when we pull away from the workpiece with our standoff distance, our gas quality is gonna diminish and the gas coverage is going to be compromised. Now, I didn't ask off the top, but I sent Mike a message saying, are you by chance right-handed? He said, yes. Now, what is extremely common is that when somebody is first learning, it is more comfortable to tilt the torch backwards a little bit like this, instead of keeping the torch angle a little closer to 90 degrees like we see here. What was happening is that Mike was leaning the torch back a little bit. Combined with an excessive standoff distance, our arc deflection was happening on this side here. Again, this is very common when people are just learning. So when Mike started to arc up and try and weld this one out, we can see that the arc deflection was firing over to this side here. 
So breaking down this photo is great. We now have a few things that we can get started with here. Now, Mike said that this was the first weld that he did. When people are first getting going and they're a little bit uncertain and especially a little bit uncomfortable, it's super common that people pull back with the standoff distance out of fear of dipping, completely understandable. But let's take a look at the second pass here. Taking a look at this one, this one totally confirms my suspicions. Now, Mike being a little bit more warmed up and ready for the second pass here, we can see that he actually got set up a little more comfortably on this one to give it another try. Now it's common that people who are a little bit uncertain about how to get comfortable for a weld pass when they're first learning, as well as the understanding of trying to develop proper technique, what typically is gonna happen is somebody's gonna get set up and comfortable for the beginning of the pass, but then as they start to advance across the weld, they are gonna to start to pull back gradually with their standoff distance like this here. We can see by this photo here, Mike was in much closer at the start of this one. We actually have some proper gas coverage. The puddle is established a little better here, but very quickly as Mike starts to travel, he's gonna run into an area of discomfort and he's gonna to start to drift away. Now, another thing that we could take a look at with these two examples here is that the overall finish of these ones looks pretty rough, quite dull. And this goes back to the original question that Mike asked about why are my TIG welds dull and not shiny? We can also take a look at things and see the shape of the puddles is not very round here at all either. They look kind of like they've been blown around or mushed or something like that. Now, this is something that is very common to somebody who has a gas volume that is set incorrectly. No worries, my friend, easy fix. So after having a good look at this stuff, this is where I come in with some good suggestions and I can help out with these issues. Now that we identified a few things that were causing these little bit of frustrations and giving us a bumpy start, Mike got back to work with some exercises that I gave him. So what were these things that we focused on? We went through a few fundamental exercises on how to properly hold and manipulate the torch. We talked about ways to get into position and be more comfortable with better posture. We went over some really fun exercises on how to find the sweet spot for a comfortable and stable standoff distance, as well as adjusting our gas settings, as well as a few things about our gear to get things running a little more smoothly. After a little bit of practice, we had some stuff kind of go like this. Then we had some other stuff kind of go like this. And then Mike was able to go from what we saw earlier to this here. Again, look at the stuff from before and then look at the work he did here. Unbelievable job, Mike, well done. Absolutely crazy to see, this stuff makes me so happy. What we did was we took steps back to identify what the problems were, figure out why and how the problems were occurring. And in my program, working together with me, I gave him a clear and concise idea of some exercises to go work on and with the hard work and motivation that Mike put in to get there, he got some results like we're looking at here. Absolutely awesome job, Mike. Again, a few really important things that we made in relation to his settings and his setup. This episode here has all that information in it. Go check it out. Do a random act of kindness today for a stranger. My name is Dusty, Phil and Chill. We will talk soon. Peace.